So today is the day after Nigerian independence from Great Britain. And so we turn our eyes to Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is has the largest economy in Africa and is also the most populous. It has at the time of um, 1960, when Nigeria got its independence, there was great hope, dreams for um, a prosperous and free Nigeria, stable. Um, over the period of time, the, many of those dreams, I think, have turned to a certain amount of despair. And it's, it's in a um, very fragile state right now. But there is now a lot of attention that is focused on Africa and on Nigeria. And we're going to hear more about that from our speaker. So without, um, so the way that our program works is as usual. Um, it will be um, that I will turn the program all over to Peter Russell. Our speaker will then make his presentation. We will then have a question and answer session. Uh, our group will ask the first questions to get the discussion going, and then we will turn it over to um, you, our viewers. If you would please put your questions into the chat, I will be monitoring them, and then I will give them to our speaker uh, to answer. So we look forward to hearing, to have a lively discussion, to hear your questions. Um, and now I want to speak, turn it, the program over to Peter. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker today. And just before I do that, I want to say one or two words about uh, the context and the uh, subject of our discussion. Uh, Joan mentioned that um, the, October 1st was the anniversary of the independence from the UK back in 1960. And uh, it's interesting that the new president who was freely elected uh, in May of this year, Bola Tinubu, uh, was someone born under the British monarchy. So right here, we, we have this sense of, of change, but also some continuity in this post-colonial uh, area, which still has some impacts on uh, Nigeria and Africa, even at the time when we're uh, focused on kind of the revival of great power rivalries in Africa and elsewhere. But uh, Nigeria really is a, a very interesting and critical country, as, Joan, as June indicated. Uh, one of the things that I turned up which surprised me was there are probably 130,000 Americans living in Nigeria, and there are uh, close to half a million Nigerians living in the United States, people of Nigerian origin. And um, there's a very considerable student population from Nigeria in the US, about 13,000. Um, during those years of independence, uh, Nigeria has uh, lived through several periods of military rule. And I, I highlight that uh, for two reasons. One is uh, since 1999, Nigeria seems to move beyond that even though the former president uh, just preceding this one was a former general. Uh, the current president comes from a civilian background as a governor of Lagos State. And secondly, the uh, questions of uh, governance and uh, legitimacy, that magic sauce of politics and succession from one government to another, one administration, and the context of, of uh, real political opposition being able to operate is critical still in Nigeria and across the distinct countries of Africa. And uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Chidi Ansem Odenkalu, is professor of, uh, professor of practice in international human rights law at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts, has very deep experience, uh, academic background, research and writing in human rights, civil rights, but also the, uh, the challenges 
for peoples in many African countries in dealing with politicians who don't adhere to the norms and practices and principles of democratic, democratic governance, and then uh, pave the way in some cases for military rule, which we've seen across many of the countries north of Nigeria in the past years. So uh, <laughs> our professor um, graduated from uh, several universities in Nigeria and received his PhD from the London School of Economics. He uh, is active uh, in a number of, uh, I'd say, civic uh, uh, areas, which really puts him in the middle of some of these uh, key issues. He's chair of the board of directors of the International Refugee Rights Initiative. He's on the International Advisory Board of the Global Rights Group in Abuja. And uh, he also has been active in some of the groups uh, trying to focus on the rights of immigration and refugees. Um, just a one quick personal note, I happen to be a graduate of the Fletcher School. I'm so proud and so uh, delighted that Professor Odin Kalu is joining us today. The floor is yours, Judy. You're muted. No, thank you ever so much, Peter. And um, good day, wherever you may be. Um, I presume people are joining from different parts of the globe. Um, I hope you hear me clearly enough. Um, and, and thank you very much for having me as well and, and uh, making this time to listen. And uh, Peter has uh, really uh, laid the foundations for um, what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in my opening remarks. And I, I wanted to try and tell a story um, rather than get into a disquisition, a theoretical disquisition about Nigeria. Um, and, um, you know, my name is Chidi. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Chidi actually means God exists. Um, uh, and that's it. The, the, the reason is I was born into internal displacement um, by parents displaced by the Nigerian Civil War. Um, and the Nigerian Civil War, of course, um, was the, um, the first major war of the television age in Africa, really. Uh, and in many ways, the war that defined international humanitarianism uh, as some of you, as some of you may recall, it actually inspired the foundation of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, um, because of the humanitarian, the complex humanitarian issues that arose in the context of that conflict, um, but also um, including questions of the nature of starvation um, as an instrument of war, and really, uh, the reason I, I was called Chidi, I'm told, was. Um, that the expectation was that kids in the neighborhood in which I was born were going to die of starvation. Um, well, I managed to survive, so I'm here. And um, now, why do I tell this story? Uh, or why do I begin with this? Because in, in many ways, Nigeria's uh, and I think Jim captured this, Nigeria's trajectory, including its, uh, and, and this of course extends to its foreign policy, has been shaped by a mix of domestic issues and neighborhood issues. Um, and broadly, I, I will identify perhaps six or seven themes, depending on how you class them. Um, two have been mentioned here. One is democracy, the other is fragility. Um, and add to that development, and that includes trade issues uh, and economic relations. Um, and there are three other Ds I'd put in that mix. Demography, and I think that's also been flagged in a sense. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa and uh, is one of the country's top 20 um, in terms of population growth rates. Officially, um, the 
population growth rate of Nigeria is about 2.58. Uh, if you listen to the international numbers, that will put it at about 20th. Syria is the top. Um, uh, but unofficially, certainly within Nigeria, the official population growth rate within Nigeria is 3.2%. That means Nigeria's population is actually growing faster than its economy. And so the country has a demand and supply crisis right there. Um, you know, more mouths to feed, potentially, or more mouths putting a demand on its supply infrastructure. Um, now, the other two Ds are diaspora um, and debt. And to that, I would add peacekeeping. Now, and that probably takes me back to the origins of the Nigerian story. Um, uh, and just a little factoid that Nigeria, after independence, as Peter tells us in 1960, or ahead of independence in 1960, the Brits actually did introduce the European Convention on Human Rights as Nigeria's National Bill of Rights in 1959, and then enacted that into the constitution in 1960 effectively introducing the first element in Nigeria's foreign configuration or configuration of Nigeria's foreign policy, because what then did happen was that subsequent to that, the Nigerian Bill of Rights was exported to every other jurisdiction, every other country in which that the Brits decolonized across the world. Um, so the only countries in the British hemisphere, essentially that didn't end up with that Nigerian Bill of Rights were India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Ghana, um, and, and Tanzania, because Julius Nyerere in Tanzania declined that export, arguing that since the Brits were not prepared to apply the same Bill of Rights in their country, he could not accept it in Tanzania, that there's some, there was something not too right about the fact this thing was so good that the British did not want it to be applied in the United Kingdom, as, and as some of you may know, it was only in 1998 uh, that the British uh, uh, legislated to apply that Bill of Rights in their country. Coincidentally, Tanzania only applied, began to apply it um, 10 years earlier than that, or enacted it 10 years earlier than that, and postdated it to just about the same time that the Brits actually decided to, um, uh, to enact it into, into their domestic law. But now, um, having got independent in 1960, Nigeria got, got independent and the first major crisis uh, in Africa was, of course, Congo. And Congo, in many ways, in a way that few people realize, shaped a lot of Africa, including Nigeria, both domestically and in terms of foreign policy. Um, the Congo crisis, of course, led to the Chapter 6 Plus, invention of Chapter 6 Plus, plus by the United Nations, um, and the deployment of the first peacekeeping mission. Um, Nigeria did supply a battalion to begin with, uh, the NIBAT, to the Congo mission in, uh, shortly after independence. And a Nigerian, General Agu Yuronsi, then became the first commander by 1964. Now, that Nigerian battalion contained, uh, in that, when we talk about military rule, that military rule was invented in Congo. The Nigerian battalion contained every soldier, bar none, that has ruled Nigeria has caused problems in the country. Um, so Mejon Zogu, who led the coup in January 1966, was in that mission. Um, General Ironsi, who became the first commander, was the first military ruler of Nigeria. Uh, when he was killed in 1960, in July 1966, his successor, General Gowon, was his subordinate in the Congo. And when General Gowon was toppled in 1975, the person who toppled him, General Murtala Mohammed, was also in the Congo. And when General Murtala Mohammed was killed in 1970, February 1976, the person who succeeded him, General Obasanjo, uh, who in fact, uh, was in this country as a guest of uh, President Carter, who also has the same birthday as Nigeria, uh, in independent Nigeria, uh, visited 
the United States in October 1977, I believe, in a very flamboyant state visit. Uh, Obasanjo was also in the Congo. Um, now, why is the Congo significant? Because the Congo was a place where soldiers in Africa discovered that they could exercise power. In the context, in the context between the Belgians, Lumumba, and the emergence of Mobutu Sese Seko, um, who originally was a journalist, actually, uh, before he then became a plotter and all of that, all, of, all, all that um, subsequently eventuated. Um, in that context, and, and uh, of course, Kasavubu and Moise Shombe, in that context, every one of them looked to the soldiers uh, for allies and an endgame. Now, the Nigerian soldiers watched this, and the Ghanaian soldiers as well, because there was also a Ghanaian battalion there. They all watched this with delight, uh, and it was revelatory and enlightening for them to see that all of these powerful politicians were looking to these young men because that's who they were. Oh, by the way, um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku, who led the country into the Biafran War, was also in the Congo, uh, I should mention. Now, so Congo then gave the soldiers ideas about political power. And when they returned, and, and it was also in the Congo that the enmities, the regimental enmities that subsequently defined the Nigerian Civil War took place. It was also in the Congo that Nigeria discovered that you could make money from peacekeeping. And so subsequently, one thing that has, uh, you know, internationally, of course, Nigeria has been known to supply peacekeepers to every place. But really, uh, the Nigeria's peacekeeping involvement is a source of money for the people who run Nigeria's uh, military forces. Uh, it's, it's, so there is a, a, a somewhat transactional element. To, to that. But the Congo, therefore, became very significant in the evolution of the landscape of governance and regional relations in the country. When the unraveling began in Ghana and in Nigeria, everyone who was involved on, as a soldier came from the mission in the Congo. And now, what then transpired, um, you know, that unraveling, of course, led to the Nigerian Civil War. During the Nigerian Civil War, you you had um, you know the, you had the contest for influence uh, um, for, amongst all of the uh, different uh, you know powers in the world. The Soviets were there. The United States uh, was uh, interested. The Brits were there. The French were reputed to have supported uh, the Biafran side uh, in the war. Uh, through Gabon, Côte d'Ivoire, and, and and some neighbors, the result of that was one major thing. Following the war, Nigeria then committed to trying to break up the French influence in in the region, and that led to the formation of the Economic Community of that inspired the formation of the Economic Community of West African States (ECOWAS). Now, I should also say, of course, that. Nigeria's foreign policy disposition, broadly speaking, in the uh, in the bipolar world, the contest between uh, the Soviets and the United States uh, at independence was a policy of non-alignment. But that was a policy of of non-alignment that pretty much favored the West. Uh, you know, you 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 had uh, you know Nigerian leaders uh, invariably did visit Washington D.C., uh, but none was spotted around Moscow. Um, and so although Nigeria was not aligned, the reality was that it did look to the West for, uh, uh, for a lot of things. Um, but the relationship with France was quite tense. And the formation of ECOWAS in 1975 had uh, signified Nigeria's um, position uh, about projecting a muscular presence in its in its neighborhood, uh, it's the dominant country, it's the anchor country in West Africa for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, in addition to that, however, in addition to ECOWAS, uh, Nigeria had this notion of concentric cycles. Uh, so the West African neighborhood, the African neighborhood, and then the rest of the world in that order. Um, uh, and so West Africa was very important, therefore, to Nigeria in that sense, and to Nigeria's leadership in succession since then. 
uh, and ECOWAS was an improbable in many ways uh, association because for the first time it broke through the uh, the club of uh, the of the French speaking countries and Nigeria of course is bounded on all sides by by countries that predominantly speak French. Uh, now that has somewhat defined how the country has approached the world through this notion of concentric circles. The other element, of course, being its position in relation to um, the events in South Africa or the apartheid South Africa, um, and uh, and its membership essentially of this of what we are called the frontline states. Then, and we could explore that in the conversations. Uh, but just fast forwarding, ECOWAS then became quite. In one other issue, uh, I should just mention the debt issue, because around the time that President Obasanjo visited Nigeria in 1977, something else was happening. Um, Nigeria had been sued. Nigeria had um, resiled on um, contracts for the funding of major infrastructural facilities. Uh, as the country, the world emerged from the Yom Kippur War, Nigeria joined OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, having discovered the earlier of new oil money. Um, and uh, Nigeria made a lot of money and probably uh, leaders in the country lost their marbles um, for want of a better expression. Um, as a matter of fact, Nigeria's president at the time of military leader was reputed to have said that the country's problem was not money, but how to spend it. And uh, Nigeria ran into a lot of problems uh, in, uh, with that mentality because uh, it ordered a lot of cement for import, for public works. Um, but uh, the cement inundated the ports in Lagos to the point where they rented port, port facilities across the region uh, just to, to, uh, to keep the cement, ran into a lot of debt as a result and tried to resile on the debt. Uh, so international enforcement action took place, which uh, during which they tried to assert sovereign immunity that failed, and Nigeria's foreign assets, a lot of them then got um, got sequestered uh, and, and used for enforcement of the debt. While that was happening, of course, global oil prices tanked. Nigeria went into a debt spiral and has never really recovered since then. It goes back to the judgment in that particular case in 1977, the Trendex v. Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, in the Court of Appeal in, the, in, in London. Uh, and in the context of that spiral, Nigeria has had booms and busts. And in one of those booms, of course, uh, in 1989 or 1990, Nigeria then undertook the enforcement action, mobilizing ECOWAS forces in the Mano River countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, in the context. Uh, and around that, that was around the time of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, but it was also the collapse of the um, of gov governance as we knew it in, in parts of the region. And the war in the, the Nigerian action in, in the invention of ECOMOG in many ways redefined global peacekeeping. Um, uh, the Security Council subsequently ratified what Nigeria did because it was essentially unilateral action, um, uh, just clobbered the other West African countries into that mission. The Security Council subsequently ratified it, and that inspired essentially Agenda for Peace and the balance uh, and the programming that then occurs subsequently under uh, Kofi Annan's tenure at the United Nations, rebalancing Article 523 of the UN Charter on regional the role of regional organizations in international peace and security. Um, uh, and uh, the, I should probably just end this phase of the converse of the introduction with uh, a mention of Nigeria's role in the reinvention of the transition from the uh, Organization of African Unity to the African Union. Um, because that in many ways uh, was the, by the time of General Obasanjo having left power to, in 1979, returned in 1999, as a civilian leader elected by the country to midwife the return to civilian rule. And um, he, with President Mbeki in South Africa, President Wad in Senegal, um, a, a, and Gaddafi, essentially midwifed the birth of what has become the 
African Union, and we can discuss what's changed since then. Um, and uh, it's interesting because this is the longest stretch of um, elective uh, governance with democratic legitimacy that Nigeria has had 24 years since 1999. Um, I, and I should just end on the note that um, we are having this conversation on the day that the um, the lawyers in Chicago are going to be deposing the um, Chicago State University officials as to the identity and qualifications of the man who currently sits as Nigeria's um, president. Um, because uh, the, the uh, question of his qualifications uh, has now become an international, has now given birth to an international incident uh, and has ended up before the district courts uh, in, in Chicago. It says a lot about the kind of world in which we find ourselves that these things, election petitions are now fought as in, in, in the realm of transnational law. But it also says something about the relations uh, and the uh, the very organic nature of the relationships between Nigeria and the United States that this is happening today. I, I'd like to end this. I, I've simply become several landmarks around which we can have uh, a more interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Kitty, thank you very much for that uh, reminder of, of history and uh, and highlighting some aspects uh, that I had never imagined putting together in a way that you have in terms of the origins of the political dynamics in Nigeria itself and, and the models for uh, peacekeeping. Um, so uh, I, I wanna come back quickly to your point about the African Union uh, as a new creation, what almost, I guess, 20 years now, but um, as, as conflicts are taking place uh, in Nigeria's neighborhood, uh, how effective are, is that kind of multilateral organization within the region in helping to um, bolster civil rule or uh, end conflicts and improve governance? Um. Well, th thanks a lot for that question. Um, the, the AU was supposed to transition the continent of Africa from a zone of, uh, from a, an era of the, in, of the primacy of sovereignty and domestic jurisdiction to an era of, um, of greater neighborliness, of so greater sovereign neighborliness and concern for what happens in your neighbor's um, territory. Um, and around that, therefore, from about 1995, the AU try, has tried to evolve norms um, on governance, um, uh, particularly topped off by what is called the norm on uncon prohibiting unconstitutional changes in government. But what an unconstitutional change in government means and how to address it, I think, is quite problematic. Uh, particularly because uh, it could not agree to prohibit interminable presidencies. Um, and that's really, the, it, the, the, the challenge, of course, is managing succession and, uh, and managing legitimate succession. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was left to different countries and different systems to manage. The countries In countries like um, Malawi, Zambia, Nigeria, and most recently, of course, uh, Senegal is wrestling with that question. Uh, the people have been able to resist efforts by long-serving or long-standing incumbents to succeed themselves, to install themselves essentially into life presidents. Uh, the AU, uh, pretty much in every case, has been unable or unwilling to assert itself and say, no, you cannot do that. And I think a, an egregious case was in uh, Guinea where a president who had been elected finished his two terms, refused to leave, uh, and altered the constitution quite violently uh, and in a very bloody referendum, which took place actually under, during COVID. Uh, lots of people who were trying to protect themselves from the virus were killed by soldiers at the instigation of the president who was trying to succeed himself. And 
um, just because they, they felt the constitution should be respected. He went on to violently alter the constitution, installed himself at the age of 82, effectively as a life president. And um, that was in 2020, in, in October 2020, the following year, the soldiers overthrew him. And the, the fact is, um, the AU has not covered itself in a lot of glory, at least in my personal opinion, um, in the manner that it's failed to address firmly the question of election rigging, uh, dishonest elections, um, and uh, interminable presidencies, and therefore has created a groundswell that's been conducive to um, a, a domino, really, of self-help by, uh, in my view, Mazanic soldiers um, purporting to salvage countries um, under the domination of particular individuals. Uh, that really, that, that, that's, that's my own take on, on that. Let me turn it over to some of the other panel people who may have a question. I, I have one which has to do with uh, the environment, and uh, the uh, you mentioned in your in your introduction the the the, the value of oil in uh, as as a both a crutch and uh, an opportunity. And uh, from what I understand, as a civil engineer, that along with that has come quite a lot of pollution and local effect in terms of health problems and things of that nature. And I wondered how, how strongly has the government been able to control or uh, in many ways use this wealth for positive reasons? Um, I wish I could tell you that the government has done so very strongly and very constructively. Um, uh, oil exists in fairly has existed in substantial but now rapidly diminishing quantities in in and around Nigeria, uh, both inland and in the uh, maritime territories of Nigeria and neighboring countries. Um, and exploitation has gone on effectively since 1956. Exploration predated that by about 20 years. Now. Uh, and as a result, the countries earned quite a lot of money uh, from this. But as I speak to you, Nigeria does not know the amount of oil it produces on a daily basis, cannot measure that. Um, it relies for that kind of information on what it is told. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the institutions, the agencies within the government that are responsible for trying to do that uh, have been deliberately incapacitated from being able to do precisely that. It therefore means that there are people within government who profit from this opacity. Uh, and that opacity is a revenue stream for private pockets. And those people are making a heck of a lot of money. Um, uh, and that's part of the reason why the country is, uh, you know, is in an overhang of debt, because a lot of money that should be coming to the state is uh, rather going to individuals in their private capacities rather than going to the public exchequer. Um, but I, I think it's also a lot more than that. Now, a lot of people are paying a heavy price for this. The, um, the standards, uh, the, the, the um, regulations under the Petroleum Act in Nigeria require that actually index oil field practice to the standards of the American Society of Petroleum Engineers. Um, but there is no monitoring of those standards. And oil field practice is dreadful as a result. You have lots of blowouts, pollution. Uh, and there are communities, as we speak, that have lived under 24 hours of sunlight. Um, but that's actually because of gas flaring. Uh, and so gas is flared perpetually. And the communities uh, have to live under that. Uh, so you can imagine what happens. Uh, the Niger Delta, which is where much of this exploration is done, has the worst presentation um, uh, of cancers uh, in West Africa. Um, you know, different manifestations of childhood cancer uh, in particular are now coming out. Uh, and 
the pollution situation is quite bad. And so the lung, uh, the respiratory disorders uh, are also um, quite significant. And a country with poor health systems, uh, you can imagine the consequences, therefore, on, on livelihoods and on, li on human life, but also on communities. Quite, uh, quite a lot of communities have, def have had their livelihoods destroyed as a result of all of this. The response of the government, rather than seek better enforcement or indeed dialogue with the operators, has been violent. Uh, uh, so it, it's been very expeditionary. Uh, since 1994, for instance, the government has deployed what is called a joint task force. The joint task force is a, a joint operation of all of the security agents, joint services, the army, the navy, the air force, the police, the state security service, with vigilantes, the politicians employ, in addition, uh, violent thugs uh, from the militia movement. Um, and then you do have also uh, mercenaries imported uh, where necessary as they, they, they see fit. Uh, and the result has been a violent militarization of the communities that are host to oil. And that has created a massive market, domestic market in small arms and light weapons. Um, and therefore has grown in security, not just in the communities that are host to oil, but also in the communities that are their neighbors, because in the contact between the joint task force and the communities trying to advocate for uh, what they believe are their rights, um, as the military uh, as the military unleashes its, its, um, uh, its tools on these communities, people retreat. To, the, to their neighbors to restock or create supply lines in their neighboring communities and then return to attack the soldiers. And this has been going on for 30 years. Um, and that is how you had the pathology of um, kidnapping and abduction of foreign oil workers. That's also created the insecurity in the maritime territory of the Gulf of Guinea. And as I speak, as we speak, the Gulf of Guinea, um, which is the coastline, coastline of Nigeria generally, uh, has the worst presentation uh, in terms of numbers of piracy in the world, uh, worse than the Gulf of Eden. Uh, 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 quite, uh, you know, that's that's just what the numbers um, indicate. Now, and all of that originated from this situation I've described. Uh, and so um, that's a summary uh, of what could actually be a much more involved story. Um, but the secur maritime security situation, as a result. In, uh, in the adjoining territory, in the territory adjacent to the inland territories that hold oil, uh, uh, it presents a major challenge to, uh, of, of, of an international nature and scale. Thank you for that, although I don't like the answer. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, I, I've got a question. Uh, Tyler and then Naomi. Naomi, you want okay. to do your mute when you can, please. Okay, uh, Achidi, you're aware, of course, that Nigeria has a relatively, probably a significantly poor record in terms of political corruption at high levels. And I'm wondering whether the election that you just went through in the spring of this year uh, could possibly produce uh, some reforms that will be meaningful in terms of trying to eliminate, uh, you know, what is a major issue for many, many developing countries. I, I wish I could tell you it, it will. I, I, wish, I honestly wish I could reassure you that it will. But look, the fact that we are having to resort to a district court in Chicago to settle the question of the identity of who our president is, I think provides the answer to your question. Um, uh, you know, first of all, this is not an issue that should be externalized to a district court in Chicago. Secondly, we should not be in a position of wondering what the identity of our president is. Thirdly, we should not be in the, in the position of litigating in Chicago to find out whether or not our president presented forged certificates, forged diplomas uh, to make himself eligible to run for the office. Now, I, I should clarify the question at issue uh, in the, you know, to run for office in Nigeria, you've got to present, um, you know, your educational credentials. 
uh, it's not much, really. What the law requires, now what the constitution requires is that you have passed, um, you have cleared the threshold of high school or its equivalent. So that's not a, a high bar. Uh, some people choose uh, to present something more. In this particular case, the person who was announced winner in the election presented a diploma from the Chicago State University, uh, uh, which uh, is now disputed, whose provenance is, is, is disputed. Um, and the university, in fact, has gone on record to say that it cannot, it's not in a position to confirm or deny that it issued the uh, diploma. Um, uh, the matter has ended up in court because uh, the people who were declared to have lost in the election are litigating uh, before the Nigerian Supreme Court and want to argue the, that particular point of, uh, of the suspicion that this diploma was in fact forged uh, before the Supreme Court. And so they need that document uh, produced. And they are also deposing today on the orders of the district court in Chicago. Uh, they, they are deposing the Chicago State University. Now, that tells you all you need to know about uh, basic principles of fidelity to ethics in public service or ethics in government or ethics in political life uh, in the country. Um, and it's not helped by the fact that the judiciary um, has really been co-opted and, uh, and captured. Um, uh, uh, in two days' time, the Chief Justice of Nigeria will be swearing in his son as a judge of the High Court. Uh, last week, he swore in the son-in-law of the President of the Court of Appeal as a judge of the Court of Appeal. Um, the wife of this son-in-law is the daughter of the president of the Court of Appeal. She was sworn in the year before that as a judge of the High Court. Um, the, and all of this, of course, cannot happen unless the politicians allow it to happen. And the politicians allow that to happen because by owning the judges, and I use that expression advisedly, by owning the judges, they effectively decide the outcomes of cases that go before the courts. Um, so the challenge, I, I don't mean to make anyone here despondent. I'm just describing the situation as it is. Because if we're not honest in acknowledging the situation, it then becomes difficult to know how to relate with it. Uh, I'm not making these things up. I am happy to provide written material to anyone who wants to read. As a matter of fact, I've written quite a bit on this. Uh, you know, um, So uh, it, is, it is a challenging situation. And as Nigerians and as lawyers from Nigeria, we've got to uh, grapple with it and see how we unfix it. Naomi, please uh, un unmute yourself, please. You think I'd learn to unmute myself? Okay. Children, in America, we used to think we didn't and wouldn't have similar problems, but we of late are working our way there. So we're not immune to the same issues you're facing, although you're further down the road on it than we are. Inflation, I read, in Nigeria is at 25%. Civil society feels, again, I read, that they're not getting the level of representation and benefits from the democracy, which has made major strides forward. What do you see coming down the road as the basis of democracy, public satisfaction and commitment to it continues to wear away or wear down? How is that, how can that be addressed? Well, um, I'll say two things very quickly. First of all, I mean, as, uh, as a foreigner, you know, looking at the United States and the events of January 6th and the aftermath, um, my, uh, and this is what I tell my students who are American as well, I actually think that uh, in many ways, the events of uh, 2020, 2021 prove that, prove the resilience of American civics and American institutions. Um, and rather than despair, 
I actually think that people in this country, and I, I, I'm in Bedford at the moment, Massachusetts, I do think that people in this country should look at that as evidence that uh, in the end, the country is resilient, its institutions are resilient. And I'm not looking at people who don't like Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm looking at people like the Secretary of State in Georgia, who is uh, a Republican, but who sees things bigger than partisan motives in administering a fair electoral landscape. And that should inspire a lot of hope and confidence, in my view, in people. And uh, you know, in terms of cultivating a coalition, uh, a credible coalition for uh, for viable civics and for uh, democratic government in the country. Uh, and I do think that uh, that can also inspire people in countries where democracy and elective government um, is still work in progress. And that includes my country. Um, now, as challenging as what I've described has appeared, um, beneath all of this, uh, the elections this year did provide, in my view, a foretaste of what's possible. You had a very angry young demographic, and Nigeria, Nigeria's median age is just about 18 years old. Over 60% of the population is under 24. Um, and you had a very young, a very angry young population who wanted to sweep away all of this stuff. It took criminal behavior uh, quite manifestly to preclude uh, the outcome that they desired. But in so doing, they were able to affect a lot of outcomes below the presidency, governorships, uh, lots of governors or uh, aspirants who uh, were unsuitable or who had been part of the landscape you described, uh, Naomi, um, were basically swept out of power at the levels of the national parliament, at the level of the chief executive or governor at the state level. Now, the politicians established criminal interests or, or, or the interests of criminal political behavior are trying to claw this back through corrupt outcomes in the election petition or uh, election dispute resolution process. And one of those happened in a state called Kano in Northwest Nigeria um, last week or last week or the week before last, um, where the courts procured a manifestly crooked outcome. I'm, I'm not going to be diplomatic about that. Um, and, you know, now Kano is the most popular state in Nigeria. And if the ruling party were to try to pull off this kind of outcome in Kano on appeal, Kano is going to go unhinged. You're going to have a massive national security crisis as a result, and it's going to involve bloodshed. Now, this is where the time hits the tarmac, that politicians have got to know that there are limits to what they can do in terms of crooked electoral outcomes. This is exactly how Mali happened. You know, in Mali, a ruling party tried to steal seats won by the opposition in an election. That resulted in a, a, a popular uprising, first overthrew, sacked the constitutional court, which had done that, been used as the instrument to procure that and ultimately sacked the government. And now we are saddled with a military government in Mali. Nobody wishes that on Nigeria because if Nigeria were to go down that route, I actually do think we are going to be ending up with a situation uh, that has implications for regional peace and security and nobody wants that. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, Wait, Tyler, let June question? go first, okay? Okay, sure. Thank you. So um, the United States, you know, is sort of awakening to um, renewed interest in Africa. So what would be, what do you think would be the most helpful in Nigeria for the United States to be doing? <laughs> That's a challenging question. Um, for, now, clearly, um, trade and economic relations with, you know, Nigeria is a vast market um, at, uh, with over 220 million people, massive entrepreneurship possibilities, and a vast market in cultural goods. 
um, I, you know, I go from end to end in this country, from New York to California, and, you know, all of the dance halls are filled with Nigerian music and young people pulsating to rhythms from Nigeria. Um, and the creative energies that have been let loose as a result of some of the challenges um, in the country are extraordinary. Uh, and I, I, you know, uh, and now the, the great thing is that all of these are getting into the market without the intermediation of the state. And digital te possibilities and digital technology are making it possible for lots of young kids who were, would have been ordinarily excluded from economic possibilities to uh, earn and, uh, and, and break through into, um, into uh, economic agency. And I do think, and this is the thing that the numbers um, that we see of Nigeria's GDP at the moment, just under 500 uh, billion USD, I believe, are nothing really compared to the real numbers because, uh, by the way, they, most of the economy is in the informal sector. Most of Nigeria's economy is undocumented. Uh, and this speaks to the question of state legitimacy because most citizens not seeing any benefits from the state don't want to subscribe to documentation. They don't want to get into documented civics or documented economic activity. And as long as that is the case, we are, Nigeria is going to be undermeasured in terms of its economic potential. So I do think the economic relations are certainly one way, uh, one possibility. But, uh, and, but clearly, another issue in my view, is regional peace and security. The Sahel is a major issue. And the Sahel is the coast of the North, as, as the, and it's always been a brutal territory historically. But, uh, you know, if you have the stretch from, uh, from Senegal, Mauritania to the West, and, uh, and Guinea, Conakry to the West, uh, to Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, and uh, uh, Port Sudan to the East, um, uh, in this, flux, violent flux, uh, with all manner of marauding uh, bands uh, from militias to Islamists to traffickers in all in, in uh, human beings, traffickers in uh, small arms and light weapons, traffickers in violence of all forms, and upsetting, uh, but also threatening capital cities, for instance, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, uh, and not to mention um, uh, as a matter of Bamako could conceivably come under threat. Um, we do have issues there. Uh, and it seems to me that, uh, and these countries are now falling under the uh, control of soldiers um, who are promising to be messiahs, political messiahs. Um, I, I do think there is a major challenge in the, in the Sahel. And there is clearly also a major challenge for maritime security. Uh, it's these three issues I'll put on the, tab on the table um, uh, I don't think the United States can fix the governance issues. I don't think any foreigner can fix the governance issues. Those will be for those of us from the region to either fight or die trying to fix. Thank you. Uh, I have a... Uh, yes, I Tyler, a, please sure. go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, it, it's kind of hard for at least me to believe that there, in fact, I guess, are 500, roughly 500 tribes in Nigeria, which is mind-boggling. But do, Chidi, give us uh, your thoughts on how the key tribe, the major tribes, which I guess are the Hausa and the Yorubas, interact. Do they basically get along with each other? Are there distinct issues that they differ on that, that are causing problems uh, and so forth? I'm just interested in the tribal makeup of, of the country which is obviously immensely diverse. Well, Nigeria is obviously, no, thanks thanks a lot, Tyler, for that. Uh, Nigeria is immensely diverse, unquestionably so. Um, I, I think the best uh, ethnographic numbers I've, mapping I've seen suggest it's got about 389 ethnic and tribal groups um, and um, over 500, somewhere in the region of about 522 link language groups uh, because languages uh, have some you know diversity of dialects so for instance if you were in the niger delta you'll see that the ijo for instance are described as one ethnicity but uh ijo dialects uh eastern ijo and western ijo are actually mutually unintelligible uh, and so they are actually different languages uh, for, for that um, um at that 
But having said that, I'm not quite sure pound for pound, Nigeria is the most diverse country in, in Africa. Um, Cameroon is not all, often put in that league. Um, Cameroon has about 25, 27 million people um, and well over 230 ethnic and language groups. Uh, that is mind-boggling <laughs> just in terms of its the complication. Uh, DRC also does, you know, will punch its weight in, in the diversity league. But coming back to your question, I think that my own experience as well is that the ethnic, uh, interethnic uh, challenges of interethnic relations in Nigeria are somewhat overblown. Um, they, and particularly the Yoruba and the Fulani Hausa that you, you speak about, because both are chiefly societies. Uh, unlike the Igbo, who are acephalos, uh, the Yoruba are chiefly, are chiefly people, and uh, the communities of northern Nigeria generally do recognize traditional rulerships. Uh, and in the Muslim communities, of course, the temporal authority and spiritual authority are fused in the Emen. Now, um, and historically, the Yoruba, for instance, had traded across Nigeria long before the establishment of the current Emirates in Northern Nigeria. And they are fully integrated across the communities of Northern Nigeria for the most part. And uh, the, you, know, you can say the same as well for the Northerners in, in Southwest Nigeria, which is mostly where you find the Yoruba. As a matter of fact, the Yoruba, are, like the Hausa, are a transnational community. So you find them in Nigeria, in Benin, up to, in Togo, up to Ghana, into Niger. The Hausa are the majority community in Niger. Now, for instance, and in, in fact, you find some of them as far as Chad. So, and so these are transnational communities that don't have the insecurities of being landlocked people. Um, I, and so, I, I do. As a matter of fact, some Yoruba have been elected into governorship positions in northern Nigeria, um, and, and indeed vice versa. What does happen with interethnic relations? is very confectioned and is happens usually around political moments around the elections where politicians use uh, identity and alienate confection notions of local alienate to for mobilization not much different from what the maga people are doing in the united states uh, mobilizing around very narrow uh, identity in a very toxic manner for a limited moment and for a limited objective. Um, intermarriage between Nigeria is massive um, across all segments of the population. Uh, and that makes it impossible sometimes to sustain some of the suspicions that um, uh, people may have about inter-ethnic relations. I'm actually, on that, on that front, I'm fairly confident about the future of the country. As a matter of fact, I would venture that the thing that holds Nigeria together still is not government of formal institutions. It is the informal relationships that have been forged by people and communities over time across these ethnic divides. That's very interesting. June, did you have any questions from the audience, please? You're muted. June, mute. No, I don't see any. I think we are. Uh... Okay. okay. So um, we have time for one more question, and then I think we'll uh, wrap it up. And any, any other panel? I, I've, I, I've got one. If if no one else does. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Chidi, how would you characterize Nigeria's uh, relations and interactions? with both Russia and China. They're somewhat different, but obviously I think in, in the US we sense there's a fair amount of sympathy with what's going on in Russia. Uh, I mean, not not total sympathy, but but kind of an admission that, uh, you know, there, there's kind of a middle ground uh, that at least your country, I think, is going to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ukraine uh, invasion. And with the Chinese, I know that you have a major trade deficit with China. 
so I wonder if there's any reason for us to think that that could be altered by shipping more goods to China somehow uh, in the future. No, I, I think that's a necessary question, actually. Um, Nigeria's relationship with China has, sorry, with Russia to begin with, has never really been too happy. Um, Nigeria's politics, for the most part, has been dominated by Northern Nigeria. And um, Northern Nigeria's, the, the leadership cadre of from Northern Nigeria has been conservative. And a majority of them, an overwhelming majority, um, are not natural Marxists or natural le leftists. Um, and I, I, I'm not even willing to taste uh, the politics of the left as an acquired taste. As a result, um, I, I, you know, and then of course, Biafra did make an effort um, to enlist Russia in its support during the war, unsuccessfully, but Nigeria still retains a bit of a memory of that. And so the relationship with Russia has been somewhat uneasy. Um, and the presence of Russian mercenaries to the north of Nigeria in Niger and in Mali has not made that any easier. Nigeria views that with a lot of suspicion. And when it comes to these kinds of things, uh, the Nigerian elite can close ranks quite easily. Uh, and so Russia is not for the most, Nigeria's relationship with Russia is at best uneasy, very uneasy. China, uh, now on, the, on Ukraine, um, Nigeria has voted against Russia in all major votes before multilaterals at the United Nations and at the, at the Human Rights Council, um, so, which is very interesting because I think uh, a very significant number of African countries, probably as many countries as voted against Russia, abstained or uh, voted in the toilet, uh, basically by being absent from, deliberately absent from the vote. Um, Nigeria has signified its opposition quite clearly. Uh, and I, most African countries feel uncomfortable with the situation, but I think on the question of territorial integrity, because Nigeria also does have issues uh, of uh, the possibility of separatist movements and secessionist movements. Nigeria is very firm on questions uh, about territorial integrity. Uh, and, and that's what drives, I think. So it is, it's concern for the domestic optics that drives its, uh, its foreign policy on, on such issues. Now, on China though, Nigeria I think has been part of this um, fad of turning to China for cheap money, as if money can ever be cheap. Um, uh, and uh, so the debt to China has grown. Um, uh, Lagos has uh, recently uh, uh, commissioned a light rail system, which is made in China. Um, the rail uh, the, 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 uh, rail system uh, is also made in China, even though it's mostly reconditioned and some of the trains have broken down um, along the way, exposing the passengers um, to, um, uh, to very significant um, insecurity risks in parts of the country where insecurity has been high. Uh, uh, but trade in, with China has risen as, uh, over the period uh, in the past, since President Hu Jintao, that's at the turn of the century. Uh, and uh, the trade deficit is in China's favor by a vast distance, uh, by a vast country mile. Um, and I, I, it's, it's fair to say that Nigeria now considers Beijing a major, uh, a major port in its diplomatic uh, relations. Uh, and, and so the uh, relationships with China are a lot in a much more comfortable place than a, the relationship with, with Russia. Good. I mean, but I, I should just end on the note that Nigeria's current foreign minister um, uh, is its immediate past ambassador to Germany. Um, and I is one of the, uh, I, I think is one of the more intelligent and more capable um, occupants of that position that the country has had since 19, 
since 1999. I, I, I'd say that quite comfortably. June, there's a, a question on chat from one of yep. the audience yeah. members. Oh, okay, June, do you uh, want to read it? Go ahead if you want to read it. I can read it, yeah. So it's from Ju uh, Joyce Leonard, and she says, do you think that young Nigerians are willing more to function outside government rather than try to reform or influence it? Um, I think actually it's a bit of both. Um, sometime in 2020, uh, I think many people in around the world, um, in terms of hashtags after Bring Back Our Girls, probably more than Bring Back Our Girls, the best known hashtag that's come out of Nigeria is NSARS, uh, which was a protest by young people against police brutality targeting young people for liquidation. Uh, we began in Nigeria in October 2020 and ended in a massacre instituted by the government at um, a uh, landmark toll gate in Lagos, uh, which was built by the government inspired by the current president of Nigeria. That's President Tinubu. And um, after that, uh, that was the effort of the young people to function outside the government. And then they were told, well, uh, you can't achieve much by doing that. And so, uh, they decided to try to reform and influence government, which is how the third party platform in the last elections, uh, in uh, the Nigerian presidential elections of earlier this year um, was uh, invented, which was young people saying, okay, you know what? We do know that we represent officially on the basis of the electoral rule, about 51% of the votes in the country. And if we could galvanize a fraction of those people to vote, we will change the landscape of the country politically. And it will be a government of our own and we can influence it and we can decide, uh, at least we will have a say in how it is run. And uh, for the most part, actually, they did achieve that. Uh, they made the country take notice. And initially they were, um, they were told that they were a digital phenomenon, a social media phenomenon, and there was no um, offline, online crossover or interaction. But then they decided to uh, translate that off uh, uh, that online community into an offline movement, and they called a rally uh, for a few thousands, and hundreds of thousands showed up quite literally. And then it became evident that these people had the numbers. Uh, what stopped them was manifest and violent manipulation of the numbers uh, by the people who have control of. Uh, the mechanisms of the state. I don't think that can last, quite honestly. So, I'm, uh, you know, as as challenging as the landscape I have tried to des describe is, I am optimistic for the country, at least in the medium term. If we can, if Nigeria can, you know, ties through the next few years, Nigeria's young people will take back their country because they are presenting questions for which the people who run the country right now don't have an answer. And at some point, those people are going to run out of, the, uh, of ideas or run out of the country. The trajectory that the country is now on is unsustainable. There's no country that can contain Nigerians if Nigeria were to be empty. And therefore the country is going to have to figure out how to fix this thing. And I do think that is what gives me hope and inspiration, which is that this situation in Nigeria is unsustainable and the country has got skilled young people within and without that can figure it out. Thank you for ending up on that optimistic note. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you indeed. And uh, thank you all those in the audience and for that last great question and to our panelists, Naomi and Don, Tyler and June and uh, Joan for bringing us all together. And Chidi, a special word of thanks to you for sharing with us this uh, down to earth and informed deep knowledge and experience you have. I hope you will come back and join us again when we can have an update. And I hope in the meantime, that all of us will be stimulated to think more about Africa and uh, individual countries like Niger Nigeria. Thank you again. Thanks ever so much and enjoy the rest of the week.